and uh, greetings from uh, New York City. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you uh, today about the brain. So um, I'm going to try to convince you that understanding how the brain works is one of the most fundamental challenges in science and in our uh, history for three reasons. Uh, the brain and particularly the cerebral cortex, which is the uh, gray matter of the brain, which forms like a rind around the center of the brain. Uh, and it's composed of, uh, of very complicated neural circuits that are built with uh, neurons such as these ones. Uh, we have astronomical numbers of neurons, approximately 80 billion neurons inside, inside our brain. And the reason that the brain is important, there are three reasons. The first one is because all of our cognitive and mental abilities are built, are generated by the brain, by these networks of neurons, these circuits of neurons that have been actually uh, called uh, by one of the pioneers in brain science as the impenetrable jungles where many investigators have lost themselves. So out of the firing of these jungles of neurons through these complicated connections, uh, the human mind emerges. Everything that we are in terms of our mental lives, our perception, our thoughts, our memories, our imagination, our emotions, our decision-making, all of that is the result of the firing of the neurons in the brain. And we know this uh, both uh, because of clinical evidence from patients that have lesions in particular parts of the brain, and they lose a particular type of mental ability. And we also know this from studies in animals, from lesion studies in animals or stimulation studies in animals. So we don't understand how the brain works today, but we will at some point, and at that point, we will understand ourselves as human beings from the inside scientifically for the first time. So for this reason, understanding how the brain works is the ultimate humanism, because it will provide an understanding of our minds, which is what makes us human. The second reason why it's most important that we understand how the brain works has to do with the patients. I'm pretty sure that every one of you has family members or friends that suffer from mental or neurological diseases. I'm talking about diseases like uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, mental retardation, stroke, anxiety, depression, all of these uh, brain diseases essentially have no cure, as you know this painfully. And the reason for that is that we don't understand how the brain works. So it's very difficult to fix the broken machine if you don't understand how the machine works. So for that reason, it's imperative that we uh, put resources in understanding the brain because only with that scientific understanding, then doctors will be able to understand what we call the pathophysiology, which is where the physiology or the function of an organ goes wrong. And finally, the third reason of why it's critically important to understand how the brain works has to do with the economy. Um, and the reason for that is that brains, not just of humans, but of any animal, are computing very complicated problems with very little energy power. So just to give you an example, our brains, a typical human brain, consumes about 20 watts of power, okay? So this is the equivalent of a low power light bulb. And with that, we process information in real time and generate computations that the fastest supercomputers have not been able to manage. So by understanding how the brain works, by understanding how these neural circuits build these mathematical algorithms that enable these fantastic computations, uh, I'm sure we will revolutionize the computer industry and our current technology. 
For these three reasons, um, it's critical to figure out how the brain works. And neuroscientists have been trying to do this now for 100 years. So you could argue, so what's wrong with neuroscientists? Why haven't we figured this out? And the reason is that we don't have the right methods. And this was uh, the idea behind the US Brain Initiative uh, that we proposed to President Obama and which he launched in 2013. The Brain Initiative is a large scale scientific project to develop new methods for neuroscience. These new methods are called neurotechnology and there are essentially two types of neurotechnology. Neurotechnology to read the information from the brain. Uh, and in our original proposal, this is actually one of the slides that we, uh, we used uh, in the White House. Uh, there was a goal, our first goal is to develop tools to measure every action potential. The action potentials is the firing of neurons of every neuron in your brain circuit to be able to actually see what's going on. And then there's uh, neurotechnology to change or alter brain activity. So you can imagine how, what we're trying to do is to read and write information into the brain. And this was the second goal of the brain initiative to develop methods. And these methods could be optical, electrical, magnetic, molecular, chemical, uh, computational. Um, to be able to not just read, but to change the activity of these neurons, because we're not going to be able to help the patients if we can beautifully describe uh, the activity of the schizophrenic brain, if we cannot go in there and fix it. We need to be able to change things. So the Brain Initiative also uh, pushed for the development of mathematical methods, computational methods, to build these models uh, of how the brain works. So in my mind, we don't have that model yet, but it will be some sort of mathematical model of the brain. The Brain Initiative, uh, it's now in its sixth year. It's slated to last uh, 15, with an estimated total budget of $6 billion. And it currently employs approximately 550 labs around the country and also around the world. So this is a massive uh, scientific undertaking and that we're starting to see the fruits of uh, these new tools that have been applied first in small animals like worms and eventually with bigger animals like flies, fish, mouse, until we get to the human brain. The US Brain Initiative has been uh, copied by other countries and similar initiatives were launched after the US one in China in Japan, in Korea, in Australia, in Canada, in Israel, and also in the European Union. In fact, all these international brain initiatives are now harnessed together in a joint global brain initiative, an international brain initiative, which was launched in 2017 uh, in Canberra, Australia. And here in this picture, you see representatives of all these international brain initiatives that were assigning uh, a document to work together as a team. So uh, this US Brain Initiative is not alone. There are similar programs throughout the world and uh, the private sector has also jumped in. And mm. as of last year, at least in the US, private companies are outspending federal investments in neurotechnology by a factor of six. So um, when we uh, did the numbers in 2020, uh, the US Brain Initiative invested uh, $500 uh, million and there was approximately $3 billion invested the same year by private companies. And the private companies, most of them are tech companies from Silicon Valley, are interested in this economic benefit of uh, neurotechnology because of the perception that the next revolution in uh, technology uh, is going to be, uh, instead of, uh, it's going to superpass, supersede the, the iPhone, and it will become some sort of device that you will wear in your head, a brain computer interface that will enable you to connect directly with the net. So let's examine how we are as of today. 
the plan for the Brain Initiative over 15 years was to start with map developing tools to map circuits of small animals, small number of neurons, and eventually graduate to larger and larger uh, animals. No? So let me show you an example of the success of these types of uh, projects in an animal which is called Hydra. And these are the animals that have the simplest brains in evolution. Hydra are uh, cnidarians, just like uh, jellyfishes, like sea anemone or corals. These are freshwater polyps that are small, on the order of a few millimeters tall. And they have a nervous system that is distributed across the entire body of the animal with very few hundred neurons. In this movie on the right, I'm showing you the complete activity the, of the entire brain of a hydra. So we've used optical methods and we've developed this neurotechnology that enable us to see when the neurons are firing. So these little sets of these little points of white are the neurons that are spread out through the body of the animal. And whenever they flash, it's because they're becoming active. So this is the first animal where someone can actually watch the entire nervous system at work. That's the good news. The bad news is that we still don't understand. In spite of this data, we're still having to figure out exactly how it generates a lot of its behavior. But work similar to this is going on in, in parallel in many other animal models, in many laboratories around the country and the world. Uh, let me show you an example also from our own group of uh, our use of neurotechnology in mice. So mice have a cerebral cortex as uh, good mammals, just like we do. In fact, uh, we think that by understanding how the cerebral cortex of a mouse works, uh, we will be able to understand how the human cerebral cortex works because our cortex is just a scale up version of the cortex of the mouse. So in this experiment, we've trained the mouse to watch a video monitor where we're showing the animal these stripes of, of uh, bars of bl black and white bars, these moving bars. And we train the animal to lick from this spout whenever he sees these vertical bars of light. So you see the vertical bars of light and the animal is now licking, okay? And um, we also train the animal not to lick when he sees these horizontal bars of light that are moving. And in this case, the animal does not lick. So by licking or not licking, the animal is telling us what he saw, whether he saw vertical or horizontal bars of light. Simultaneously, we're using the same uh, neurotechnology that I showed you with Hydra to measure the activity of its brain circuits in its visual cortex, the part of the brain that's processing visual information. So the experiment is actually the following. We first show the mouse the vertical bars of light so that the animal licks. This is what we call the go stimulus, the visual stimulus. And we measure a group of neurons that is activated by these vertical bars of light. Okay. Then uh, using the same method, calcium imaging, with a micro microscope, we map the neurons, in this case in green, that are activated when we show the animal a horizontal bar of light, which is the no-go stimulus. In this case, the animal does not lick. And now comes the experiment. We turn off the visual stimulation, the video screen, and we turn on a second laser, okay? And using a holographic device, we stimulate precisely the neurons that were activated by the GO stimulus, by the vertical bars of light that trigger the leak behavior. And when we do this, when we activate these neurons in the brain of the mouse, the mouse leaks. In fact, he leaks exactly the same way as if he were seeing the GO stimulus, the vertical bars of light. There's no difference in the number of times that he licks in the speed of the licking. 
and in the delay between the presentation of the stimulus and the licking. In other words, the animal is behaving as if he is seeing this image that we're introducing into its brain with neurotechnology. We're manipulating his perception to the point that we're essentially turning him into a puppet in which he leaks or doesn't leak according to whether we activate this blue group of neurons or this green group of neurons. This is all in, in animals, but what's possible in animals today, in mice today, will be possible in humans tomorrow. So um, I'm showing you that from animal research, we can, uh, using optical neurotechnology, we can measure, monitor, and manipulate neuronal circuits to the point that we can manipulate the behavior of an animal. Again, this is, we're still at sort of the beginning of the brain initiative in the US and in all the other countries and that this is likely to be much more potent in the future. So let's turn our attention now to humans and let's discuss how is this new technology uh, been developed for uh, human beings and what's the status of it. So first of all, uh, the fact that you can uh, read uh, and decode brain activity like we're doing with mice and manipulate it has not escaped uh, the press. And these are examples of some uh, prominent publications uh, that are starting to highlight the possibility that neurotechnology will enable to decode the minds of people. And uh, based on what I was told you, what I told you at the beginning, that the brain generates the mind, if you can read brain activity, in principle, you could decode the mental activity. And if you can write activity into the brain and manipulate brain activity, in principle, you could actually change and, and manipulate mental activity. So let me show you some examples of brain decoding. So this is the work of my colleague, Jack Allant at uh, Berkeley. And he uses fMRI machines. So these are magnets, scanners that uh, are hospital grade. And he puts a volunteer in the scanner and he builds maps of the activity of the brain, in this case, the cerebral cortex, when he shows the volunteer one image. This, uh, what you're seeing in front of you are the two hemispheres of the cerebral cortex that are not crumbled inside our heads and we flatten them out or he has flattened them out. So this is the left hemisphere and this is the right hemisphere, okay? So uh, this way uh, we can see in color the areas of the cortex that light up when the person is looking at a particular image. So imagine that the person is looking at an image of a dog and uh, you scan its, his brain and this is the map of the brain, the activity of the brain in response to the image of a dog. And now uh, imagine that we show the person a different image, an image of a cat. No? And you get, you scan the brain and you get a different map that looks different from this one that represents the image of the cat. And you do this with a hundred different images and then comes uh, the experiment. Uh, you ask the person to think of one of the images that uh, he has seen. The person thinks, let's say, of, uh, of the dog. You scan his brain and said, hey, you're thinking about the dog, correct. And then comes the more intriguing uh, experiment. They ask the person, think of an image that we have not shown you something that we have not displayed in our screen. And the person thinks of an image, for instance, the front door of, of his house. No? They scan the brain and using this collection of maps of brain scans in response to different stimuli, they can triangulate a little bit like it shows here and they get close to what the person is thinking. To the what well, the person is imagining, to be more precise. So they cannot yet completely nail it, but they start to get pretty close. So they can say, well, 
you're thinking of a building or you're thinking of a square or rectangular object. No? So they cannot tell you that you're thinking of the door of your house, but they're starting to be able to, to decode the images that people have in their heads. Let me show you an example of this brain decoder uh, at works. So on the right, uh, you can see uh, a movie, a video clip that we're showing to the patient, to the volunteer. <laughs> okay. And on the left, these words are the output of the brain decoder that is taking this brain scanning of the person while the person is watching this movie and deciphering these brain scanners, these brain maps, with these maps of existing uh, images. So for example, uh, you can see a beach with buildings and palm trees, people walking, and the brain decoding is saying, is decoding sky, walking, buildings, body of water, road, tree, people. No? So uh, now suddenly there's some young women that appear in the talking to a man and look what the brain decoder is decoding. Woman talking to a man, face, room, etc. So uh, I would say that this is pretty impressive. These are uh, using uh, hospital grade uh, fMRI machines. And this work that I'm showing you was already done a few years ago. Um, now, uh, because of the push to build new technology by the private industry, we now have some portable brain scanners. And let me show you one that was just recently uh, released, which I tried on myself. It's actually, I think it's a pretty good uh, brain scanner. It's portable. You can wear it at home. You can wear it while you walk. It's called uh, Kernel Flow. It's uh, built by this company called Kernel in, in LA. And these are examples of, uh, of responses uh, of these um, brain maps to the presentation of a particular stimulus to the person that's wearing it. No? So you can imagine that uh, these types of brain scanners that are now uh, starting to be uh, released into the market uh, are going to generate brain maps that could be in principle decoded. They don't have the spatial or temporal resolution of these big hospital magnets but um, they will get their new technologies advancing very quickly. No? So we have to be prepared for the possibility of systematic decoding of brain activity using brain scanners such as this. Uh, I told you about um, the using of brain scanners to decode um, uh, images. Let me now talk to you about uh, invasive neurotechnology. So this is neurotechnology that's implanted in the brain. And uh, here we have a patient uh, that's paralyzed, tetraplegic, and she has an electrode inserted into her brain, into her frontal cortex. And this electrode is connected to a computer that's operating this robotic arm. This is a brain computer interface. And by uh, thinking, during a period of training and an algorithm that uses artificial intelligence, the person can train the robotic arm to move by her will. And in this case, this is a successful trial in which the patient is thinking and by her thoughts, moving the robotic arm to the point that she's given herself a drink by her own volition for the first time in 20 years. This is an impressive use of neurotechnology to help paralyze patients. This is incidentally all technology pre-brain initiative. Look how uh, happy she is now that she's been able to uh, drink by herself. And uh, again, this was only with one electrode I love when uh, she smiles here at the end. So now imagine what's going on with the Brain Initiative. This is now a chip that's been built under a DARPA program, which instead of one electrode has 1 million electrodes. This is an implantable, flexible chip that is wireless. So um, the idea is that you can insert it under the skull 
and position it on top of the cortex. And with this chip, you can do recording of brain activity and stimulation of brain activity wirelessly from the outside. So this chip has been developed by my colleague Ken Shepard at Columbia. Uh, and uh, the idea of the Starpa program is to develop this chip for uh, as a prosthesis for the blind to put this chip on the visual cortex of people that have peripheral blindness. So uh, you could literally make them see by connecting this chip to a camera, a video camera that would pipe in that information wirelessly into the brain of a person. But this chip could also be con uh, put in a different part of the brain. And instead of connecting the person to a camera, you could in principle connect the person to the net and uh, use these brain computer interfaces to both decode or activate brain circuits, brain activity. Now. So this raises a lot of ethical and societal issues. Again, this all has to do with the fact that the brain is not just another organ. It's not like the heart or the liver. Uh, it happens to be the organ that generates the human mind. And that's what makes us human. So any technology that interfaces directly with the brain in terms of recording or stimulated brain activity opens the possibility at decoding or changing or activating mental processes. So a group of us, uh, we call ourselves the Morningside Group, got together in uh, 2017 here at Columbia in this building. And this is the building where I'm talking to you from, in fact, from this window here. And we got together in a conference room that we have here. <clears throat> and these are a group of 25 that uh, represented the brain initiatives from all over the world. Also from uh, some representatives from Silicon Valley and experts in neurotechnology like myself, experts in neurosurgery, clinicians, neurologists, experts in bioethics, in, in the law. And we came to the conclusion that uh, neurotechnology needs to be regulated before it's developed and used uh, by the population. And we propose the idea that uh, this is a human rights issue. Uh, incidentally, we met this building is right across from this old brick building, which is in, in the National Registry of Historic Places, because in the basement of this building, Pupin Hall, this is the physics department. In its basement, they built the first atomic reactor in the world. And in the 1940s, the same group of physicists who built the first atomic reactor launched the Manhattan Project, which built the first atomic bomb. In fact, they call it Manhattan Project because it started here in Manhattan before they took it out to Los Alamos in New Mexico, not because they were worried about uh, radiation safety, but because they were worried about securing Manhattan from German spies. So this is an example of a group of scientists that have developed a technology that could be of existential importance for humanity. And the same scientists that developed this technology were the first ones interested in pushing, advocating for the regulation of atomic energy. And as a consequence of that, the United Nations created the Atomic Energy Commission in the 1950s, which has been regulating the use and deployment of atomic uh, energy and, and nuclear weapons since that time. Fingers crossed without any mistakes yet. So inspired by this, we propose uh, a set of ethical um, priorities and ethical issues that we think uh, belong to the human rights arena because uh, the human rights define better than any document uh, in the world what it means to be human. What are the properties and the characteristics of a human being? So we propose new human rights, and we call them neural rights as brain rights, that will uh, help uh, uh, deal with potential misuses of neurotechnology. Our position is that neurotechnology is not only good, it's absolutely urgent and necessary for the reasons that I gave you earlier, particularly from the, it's urgent from the point of view of the patients who are looking at us every day on the eye and said, can you help me? But at the same time, we have to provide guardrails, ethical and societal uh, guidelines so that these technologies are applied 
for the good of humanity. So we're proposing these five uh, new human rights that should be added to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which you can see here in this wall. This is the entry to the Museum of Historical Memory in Santiago, Chile, which is uh, one of the best museums in the world devoted to human rights. And in the wall, they've written the 30-some articles of the Universal Declaration. So we want to add five new articles to this wall of Chile. The first one is the right to our mental privacy so that the contents of our brain activity are not decoded without our consent. Uh, and uh, this is a much uh, more worrisome concern than the usual privacy concerns that you're dealing with and we're dealing with in terms of uh, privacy of our electronic communications and our data. Because one thing is for people to uh, decode or read your email, and another thing is for people to decode and read your thoughts. This is even more important because most of brain activity is not even conscious. But you can decode everything that's in there, whether it's conscious or not. So it's technically possible, it will be possible to decode certain aspects of the personality of a person that the person is not aware of. We think this is a basic human right uh, and we need to define very clearly the boundaries of uh, the protection for our brain data. The second one uh, has to do with the neurotechnologies to change brain activity. And this is to protect our identity, our self. Um, just like uh, I've shown you with mice, uh, you can essentially turn animals into puppets by activating or inactivating particular brain areas. Now, and uh, we think that we should be entitled as a basic human right to our own self. In fact, that should be our, the first human right because if you don't have the right to your to the self, what are the rest of the rights good for? No? Related to this is the right to our own agency. So our own free will, the ability to make decisions. Again, as I illustrated in the mouse example, you know, uh, when we make a decision, uh, it should be based on our own brain activity without any interference from the outside. And this is particularly important for neurotechnology because people have always been trying to influence other people's decisions as long as, as we, the world has been around. But with neurotechnology, it's the first time that this influence is so insidious because once it's inside the brain, it becomes part of you. As I told you, these mice behave exactly the same. If we're putting these images, these hallucinations inside their heads, as if they're seeing these patterns with their own eyes. So we think uh, the free will, our agency should be protected as a basic human right. Finally, there's two uh, human rights that we think are needed, uh, and this relates to the societal use of neurotechnology. I've shown you some examples of brain-computer interfaces, and with these BCIs, as we call them, uh, you can connect the person to the net. And sooner or later, this is going to lead to mental and cognitive augmentation. In fact, some neurotechnology companies like Neuralink, started by Elon Musk, their declared mission is to mentally augment humans with neurotechnology. And um, the chip that I show you, the wireless chip, you can imagine using it, um, putting it in a person and connecting that to an infrared camera, an X-ray camera, so that this person will literally have infrared or X-ray vision. This is an example of sensory augmentation, but you can imagine access to uh, data sets, uh, uh, all kinds of, essentially everything that we do as, as humans could be augmented by the use of technology. So this uh, creates the possibility of a fracture in our society with two types of human beings. Some that are hybrid that have been uh, augmented and others that have not. Because of that, we think that the access to augmenting technology, neurote neurotechnology that used for mental or cognitive augmentation should be based on the universal principle of justice and should be uh, guaranteed, uh, it's a basic human right, 
fair access to cognitive augmentation to prevent precisely the situation, this break in, in our humanity with two types of humans. And the final has to do with the ethical uh, issue of protecting the user of new technology from bias and discrimination of the algorithms that are used in neurotech. So I described how neurotech uh, are devices, but they have, of course, a software and AI algorithms associated with it. And again, this protection from bias is particularly insidious because, uh, as I showed you with the mouse, the neurotech will implant this information directly inside the brain. So people and people or will essentially conclude that this is their own beliefs. This is not something that comes from the outside. So right now, if you, you're reading your Facebook um, feed and people are trying to bias you, you still recognize that this is something external to you. You're looking at it through your eyes. But if it comes straight into your brain, you will identify that as your own, as yourself, as your beliefs. So this is our agenda. And uh, we've been essentially um, pushing for uh, advocating for neural rights uh, with uh, different countries, with different internationalizations, and also with the private industry. And uh, uh, we have some success uh, in the case of Chile. The Senate of the Republic of Chile has adopted this agenda, and they approved unanimously a constitutional amendment that makes mental integrity a basic human right and it defines it as non-manipulable. In addition, the Senate of Chile, uh, led by Senator Girardi, which is here, and also with the support of President Piñera, of, uh, of the president of the country, uh, have endorsed a neural rights bill, a bill of law, which specifies the conditions in which neural technology should be used and developed in Chile. And... Uh, the most important aspect of this bill, which has a lot of detail, is that it defines all neurotechnology as medical devices. In other words, it makes neurotechnology, whether it's invasive or not, whether it's a chip that is implanted into your brain or a wearable that you can wear like I'm wearing these headsets today, it makes it all the purview of the Chilean equivalent of the FDA, the Institute of Public Health, which registers all medical devices and approves and regulates the conditions for their use. So this is uh, a medical model, and this is a model that uh, we think could be applied to many countries, including maybe the U.S. And this would, of course, would require a broader definition of the purview of regulatory bodies such as the FDA, um, that would start to include into their uh, devices also consumer electronics that have neurotechnology capabilities like these uh, non-invasive uh, wearables, like these uh, portable brain scanners or this cerebral iPhone that's in the, in, in, in the future. So um, let me just uh, finish. Uh, we've uh, created uh, an initiative at Columbia, the Neural Rights Initiative, which has a network, a grassroots network of activists throughout the world, and we just turned ourselves into a foundation. So now, as of uh, this month, we are the Neural Rights Foundation. And uh, our foundation is a nonprofit foundation, and its goal is to advocate for neural rights also to uh, to disseminate information and perform outreach uh, so that uh, we can uh, we can provide this information about this revolution that's going on in neurotechnology to the public and also to seek uh, partnership with interested organizations that may feel also um, that it is time for uh, the uh, regulation or prov provision of guidelines for the development of new technology and its use in society. I wanted to finish. Uh, uh, some of you may be a little worried about the perils of the uh, unregulated use of new technology, but uh, I just wanted to finish on a positive note. I think uh, we're at the brink of a new renaissance, thanks to new technology. 
So uh, why do I say that? In the Renaissance, after the, the dark Middle Ages, uh, humanity um, uh, understood that the body is not sacred, that the humans are not the center of the universe. And this led to the birth of modern science and to the idea of an interdisciplinary Renaissance man uh, that triggered a revolution in art and essentially generated a humanism as we understand it today. You know? The types of, of uh, beliefs and, and, uh, and thoughts about the role of humans in the world. With neurotechnology, we will access and understand the organ that makes us human. So this is going to be understanding ourselves from the inside. Uh, this will lead to a revolution in brain diseases, as I discussed, understanding our own mind. And it could actually uh, lead to very critical insights into the roots of human conflict, for example. Why do humans engage in war? So at the end of the day, there are particular brain areas, in particular leaders, in particular segments of the population that are activated in particular ways that lead to, to conflict. So understanding how this is happening in the human brain would surely help uh, strategies to prevent conflict and and uh, essentially and prevent uh, war, which I, I view as, uh, as, uh, as, as an example of our our needs in terms of um, more humanistic approaches to our to our society. You know? uh, knowing about the brain will uh, generate also a revolution in the law. I'm sure that many of the people that we have in prisons today are not criminals, but patients, uh, because they have particular brain circuits that are misfiring or that they're abnormal. And it would also lead to a revolution in education, since if we understand how the brain learns, we'll be able to build uh, educational activities that actually profit from these brain mechanisms. It would also inspire a new type of technology, neuro-inspired technology, that I think will have uh, revolutionary effects in the economy. And uh, just ending with the idea that we will get to understand ourselves better and uh, and and uh, decide uh, what it means to be human, and this is a decision that we have to take together. And uh, I think, or we think, uh, or the group that I represent thinks that this is would be the purview of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. No, and we should uh, decide in a democratic fashion what it means to be human and inscribe it in the universal declaration of human rights and res and respect it and, and 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 make people respect it and with that i i finish and we have time for some questions thank you